Welcome back, everybody, to our coverage of the Champions Chess Tour. It's the new in Chess Classic. It's day number two. We're in the preliminaries, so there's 16 players, and eight of them will make it to the knockout bracket. As always, I will take you through some of the most interesting games of the day, considering we have 40 games. And if I'm a little bit low energy today, please excuse me. I just got back from being out of the house, uh, and I saw my friend who has two dogs. I posted one of them on Twitter. Uh, and I have a pretty bad dog allergy, so I'm more or less lethargic, and I just sort of feel like I've been hit in the face with a baseball bat. Uh, I would have hoped it would have made me prettier, but sadly it did not. We're kicking things off uh, in round number six, uh, because today is the first game of the second day, so round six. And we have the Norwegian matchup between Ari Antari and, well, none other than Magnus Carlsen. So we have E4. And Magnus goes for g6. I mean, he's playing, you know, the number two player of the country, kind of the protege. He's got to mix it up a little bit. He plays the modern defense. d4, d6, knight c3, <laughs> c6. Okay, so um, mildly meme, mildly disrespectful. And the interesting thing is the three players, and when I say disrespectful, I just mean that this is not very common. It's kind of considered bad. It's not a mainline opening. Um, but it's perfectly playable, especially when you're Magnus Carlsen. The interesting thing about the three Norwegians in this tournament, Carlsen, Tari, and Christensen, is they're all playing in the same room because they're trying to make it, you know, more communal and nice and interesting that all these guys are kind of in this one location. So they're sitting next to each other but have to play each other. F4. And now Magnus plays D5. And the idea of D5 is that all these pawns are in light squares. And now you are creating a light squared kind of structure. So white goes to E5 and basically says, I'm going to fight for the dark squares, and you can have this light squared area. So since black has good replacement of the light squares, what black does is play, and by the way, yes, this move as well to fight for these squares, black will put the knight on f5 and trade this bishop, right? And trade this bishop in a moment like this. Because now you have very good replacement on the light squares, and this knight is very pretty on f5. Now, Magnus needs to prevent the move g4 because that will kick out his knight and now actually white will have dominance of the light squares So he plays h4 and the really useful move. I mean not move the really useful rule of chess um, g On passant stops this move g4 on passant and um, You would not be able to achieve it. So h4 and now the players switch their attention to the other side of the board so knight to e2 that whole side hasn't been occupied a5 your opponent does it, so you should do it too, obviously, a4. Knight a6, c3, so that the knight cannot come into b4. And Magnus says, rather than castling, I'm just going to walk my king over to g7. And he does exactly that. The king will be very safe on g7, and that's where it slowly arrives. Whereas, as you can see, Tari is ready to play this move b4. So, in a very close position, where only, for example, one set of minor pieces has been traded, and there are eight pawns each, that means the position is extremely close. Like, both sides have built their fence, and it's where you find those openings in the fence that matters, right? So, Tari goes for b4, and Magnus has a decision. Does he take or does he leave it? And he decides to leave it. In fact, he anticipates that ba5 will come in the future, and then he will take back while also making sure that his weakness is defended with a move like queen to c8. And he will actually turn the tables on Tari. That is exactly what Magnus is hoping for. So when he plays rook a8, well, Tari doesn't take just yet, but now he takes. And I guess his intended purpose was to line up an attack over there. Except Magnus delays. And now he takes. And what's interesting is that this move is not good at all. In fact, this move does nothing except make a one move threat. And all it takes against Magnus Carlsen is to push one wrong pawn because then the rook would back up and all of a sudden this is going to take this and then this is going to take this and then I'm going to take everything else. So Tari tries to slow play it and he plays knight c5 and he plays a5 and he makes progress and then here, you know, it's move 25 and Magnus Carlsen gets his chance. It's move 25. He's been worse the whole game according to the computer. Computer hates this position for black and he immediately drops his knight into b5. And if you just look at that, it looks like takes, takes, takes. I'm so happy. Bang, bang, bang. I'm up a pawn. Magnus, you're a bozo. Blundered your pawn. I'm going to beat you. Except then there would come this move. And all of a sudden, you can't take me because of this pin. And then you have to back up. And all of a sudden, I have a new A pawn. And I'm just going to advance it down the side of the board. We'll trade. Bang, bang. What happened? So Tari doesn't take the knight when it arrives on b5 because he doesn't see that. He does, I mean, he doesn't see that as good for him. So he backs up and 
That's all Magnus needed. First, he takes on a5. We have a trade. We have one more trade. We have rook b5. Queen's under attack looks very scary. Nah, queen a7. Magnus says, you had more space on that side of the board. And now it's gone. And my bind is still very good. And ladies and gentlemen, if I asked you in this position, where is black's only pawn break? We talked about pawn breaks, close position. Where's black's only pawn break? Right? So it's move 20, not it's move 30 right now. In 10 moves, that will become relevant. First, Magnus kicks out in the night. Then Magnus defends his pawn from the pin, right? You see Tari pinning. So he defends the pawn. Then he moves the rook out of the way of the pin. So the knight has to come back. He moves his queen up one square, attacks the knight. Tari moves it back. Now Magnus says, that looks really cozy. Boop. I mean, if you can move your queen to the opposite side of the board and it's safe and it's good, do it. Queen d2. Magnus says, oh, thank you. Thank you. Now I have access this way. Thank you very much. Oh, rook b1. All right, I'll just go to a3. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just pressure like this. Ah, oh, knight c2. I'll take, take. Bring my queen back to the middle. Now my queen hits all of your pawns. Hey, remember that pawn break I told you about? Oops. And you know what the worst part is? Because black has a bunch of pawns on light squares, it means that white has a bunch of... A, 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 sorry, a bunch of pawns on... I said light squares, right? Well, white has a lot of pawns on dark squares. You know which bishop is on a dark square? That one. You know which bishop, if it gets in, is going to absolutely obliterate everybody? That bishop. G5. If you take it, it looks like you're just... Well, king is gonna come. Well, I'll win it back in a moment. And that's exactly what it does. He brings his king. And even with the trade, it puts his knight right back. And what's interesting is that if you plug this into a computer at, 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 at a, like a depth of like 35, it's like zero, 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 bro. Like, I don't... I don't like so. And well, that's, that's the beauty of Magnus Carlsen. He doesn't... First of all, he's just... He's a beauty. Second of all, he doesn't need much. So he just brings in the queen, a little bit of nagging pressure, a little bit of... Except actually in this position he blundered because bishop takes h4 was possible. A move that looks uh, impossible. Uh, knight takes h4, queen f6 would have been very bad. But that aside, and low time aside, it looks like he's just clamping down. He wins this pawn. And Tari plays a queen trade. Takes, takes, knight to g3. Then this just straight up loses the game on the spot. Because after knight h2... Oh, uh, sorry, king h2, knight e2, and the king comes. He just takes, and the knight jumps in, and then he plays this flank break, takes it, knight d4. I mean, it's, it's just typical Magnus stuff, just lingering pressure, and he goes back for that pawn, and ultimately he moves his king out of the way and just avalanche down the center. And here Tari resigns because the e and d pawns made it all the way down the board. Just a very typical game where you have, you know, white against Magnus Carlsen, you have an optically good position. Your position looks good. And the second that you try to do something, he knocks you unconscious. What are you gonna do? I mean, next game. What's interesting is that I just showed you round six. We are skipping round seven and eight, completely. Completely skipping round seven and eight. Why? They were garbage. I'm not saying the players are bad. The games just weren't great, you know? They just... Round nine is when these dudes got into hockey fights. Like, these dudes must have drank something. Like, except Prog, because Prog's 15. But the rest of them, when it was round eight break, they just decided to take some shots. Whiskey, vodka, you know, you name it. Tequila, I'm a tequila guy. Um, ex unless you're a kid watching, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't drink. I, I don't know what, just roll that back. Um, they must have taken shots or something and agreed that in round nine they were going to fight. Because in round nine of the eight games, seven were decisive. Two bozos drew. I don't even know who they are. Seven games were decisive. Seven people won, seven people lost. We are going to begin, actually, with this game. Hikaru Nakamura versus uh, Johan Sebastian Christensen, uh, one of the Norwegians. We have E4, E6, and already something weird, F4 against the French. And this is the point, is that you play knight F3. And then c3, and when black white plays queen b6, anticipating the move d4, you wait with this stupid looking move. This just looks like you're tilted. This just looks like you're, you know, upset from previous games, so you're going to play some nonsense. But it's a very legitimate concept. The concept is to move the knight back, and then move the bishop, and slowly build up for, for, for d4. But Christensen plays d4 himself. So Kikaru moves the king out of the way because he doesn't actually want any beef with this queen. I wouldn't want a beef with no queen either. 
and uh, Christensen plays f6 trying to break in the center. We have takes takes and b3. The idea of b3 is twofold. You want to play bishop to b2. At the same time, you also could consider playing bishop to a3 and trading off this bishop, which is very important, bringing your knight there, then there, and then to d6, where it's just nice and pretty and destroys everybody. So we have a5, which I don't fully understand, but bishop to b2, Hikaru goes for the d4 pawn, and plays this important move, stopping the pawn from ever advancing and counteracting this move knight to f5. Of course, he would just take. So Christensen goes back to f7. If you notice, Christensen still hasn't castled. So Kikaru plays queen e2. He's like, the guy's king is in the middle. What should I do? I should open up the center. And here Christensen plays long castle. And Hikaru said, really? Like, you sure? You know, like you're in class and you like say the right answer and your teacher goes, you sure? Is that your final answer? Sometimes they trick you because you have the right answer. Um, Johann Sebastian Christensen did not have the right answer. A3. This one subtle move, pawn A2 to A3, is the end for black. I could end the game here. But, no, that would be like showing you a movie trailer. F takes E5, F takes E5, and anticipating that this is... By the way, Christensen should 100% just, like, go all out. But he backs up. And you know how you're not supposed to, like, run away from a bear? That's what they say you're supposed to. I mean, I don't, I've never encountered a bear. Um, I'm from New York City. I, we don't have those here. Um, we have rats. You didn't really ask, but I'm, yeah, I once saw like a rat with a, like on the train. Anyway, uh, that aside, queen c7, you're not supposed to run away from a bear because it's going to run faster. Rook c1, king to b8, pawn to b4. Opposite side castling means that you are going to attack your opponent. Knight to e7, knight takes d4. Now he has an extra pawn. And then Christensen played rook to f8, and Hikaru played knight e3, and this queen is trapped. It cannot actually go to b6. It looks like it can, but knight c4. And then when queen goes here, well, I have a couple of ways to do this, but one of the nicest is just knight here and then just take your knight for free because of this. So Christensen on knight e3 just decides to go queen e5, check, and then check. And Hikaru wins two pieces for a queen. It's not over yet. He has to still be precise. So he defends everything, plays rook d1, and then just plays d4. He just plays down the center, not really worried about the loss of a pawn because the position will open up. Now he trades the knights, he trades the rooks, and he plays queen c5 check, pushes the pawn, brings out that bishop, takes the knight, and I mean... Just make sure that he's never ever going to get back rank mated, takes, brings the queen back, and ends the game by moving that a pawn, the same a pawn. And just as a nice fancy final act, he sacrifices the rook for the bishop to infiltrate with the queen. And here Christensen resigned because a6 bishop takes and queen to a7 mate is coming. Uh, yeah, Hikaru beat Christensen so hard it was like Christensen owed him money. Like, I, that was... Yeah, long castling was no good. Uh, he had to probably go short side. And even then, it's like, I mean, even short side here, it's, you're, it's probably bad news coming. Uh, so most likely even that doesn't work. I don't know. Maybe he had to castle earlier. C castle, folks. Just, just castle. Stop not castling. All right. Some other really, really disgusting games this round in round number nine. Uh, Pragnananda Ramesh Babu versus Timur Rajabov. Uh, we have a... Uh, Queen's Gambit declined, so obviously you would think we're not going to get an exciting game, but holy hell, ladies and gentlemen, yes we are. Bishop to f4, um, and e3. Knight to d7, c5. Now, if you have been watching the candidates' recaps, you know that uh, Dingley Ren and Grisha played a game like this. Essentially, black goes for a position where black has a catastrophic spatial deficit, but has the experience of being a super grandmaster versus a 15 year old grandmaster. And also it's just, you know, black is okay here. Like black is gonna suffer like a Buddhist for a while and then will achieve the enlightened status. Um, and that's about all of the Buddhism knowledge that I have, uh, but uh, black is okay. Like black's position looks really depressing and most likely it is, but and, you know, black is at least not going to lose. So G3, Bishop A6 and Prague takes, takes and plays Queen E2. Now, the game would certainly not end with queen takes rook. That would be hilarious. So he moves the rook out of the way. 
But here, uh, I think Rook A7 is a slight inaccuracy because it allows Prague to play this very nice pawn break. We have eight pawns on the board. You always look for pawn breaks. F5. Now, some of you might say, well, B5, obviously B5, because after pawn takes, knight takes. Fork, I'm so smart. You are. You're really smart. Everything that you said is 100% true, except for the fact that I don't have to take on B5. Like, you're right. If I take on B5, I'm a complete idiot which I am separately of chess, but that's just a fork. I can just take this pawn instead. I don't actually have to take this. You need to prove yourselves wrong, not prove yourselves right, right? So we have f5, which is significantly better because whether you take me and lose a bishop or not, I'm threatening to take you. This move forces Rajabov to play the move uh, a takes b4, a takes b4, and like just do something. He needs to react to the position and play the move e5. Um, Again, on the surface, it looks like if you just take, just beat, like, right, just this move. So, Prague takes with the knight. Takes with the knight, we get knight takes, pawn takes. We get bc5. And rather than just lazily taking back, Prague plays this interesting move, b5. And this is a tough position now, because if you take me, I'm going to take d5. And this is just lost for, like, literally one capture, and the game is over for black. Because I just have dominant control of the center and I'm going to play f6. My knight is very strong with pressure. I will play f6, crack open your king and uh, beat the king like the king owes me money. So instead of that, Rajabov plays d4. He just counterattacks. And here, my man, Pragnananda Ramesh Babu says, you know what's worth more than a knight? I've seen enough Gotham Chess YouTube videos. The viewers are worth more than a knight, but a queen is worth more than a knight. b6. Oh, what's this? Okay, if you take it, now the queen is deflected off the center, so I can play a move, knight e4. It doesn't matter that my queen doesn't guard my pawn anymore, because you can't take my pawn, and that's all the time I need. Now Rajabov's like, whoa, I really don't like the prospect of f6, let me play f6. But now Prague gets a connected, protected past pawn. Mm, that doesn't look very good, and he can't do anything, Rajabov can't do anything with, the, with, with anything over here, so he plays queen b5, queen a2. Okay, so c4, d3, right, it's coming. Plays queen d3, and Prague again refers to that video, what's worth about as much as a knight. A bishop. I don't need to guard my knight. I can just go in. Takes, takes. Queen takes f5. And here, we have h4, making sure that if you're ever checked on the back rank, you will hide on h2. Right? So that's why you play h4. And by the way, maybe you'll play h5, h6. In fact, maybe you'll play, right, h5, h6. So Rajabov plays h5 himself to prevent that. Now, you are a move away from mate at any given moment, so your queen needs to stay defending. And what's interesting is that here, after rook d7, like, you can't play d3 because I'm going to take you. And if you play c4, um, then I have a threat, and my threat is to go to the back rank and force out your king, and then, right? So if he plays rook d7, we have rook a8, and Rajabov is a move away from mating, and... uh Plays that, and rook d8 check. Takes, takes, and Rajabov just resigns. Wait a minute, what? Uh, huh? What? Wait. So where did Rajabov go wrong? Well, if Rajabov had given a check and just went back to g4 and did nothing, and then rook d8 happened, then we would have gotten this, this, okay? You with me? S looks very similar, right? But the king is on the wrong square. Now we would have queen to e2. And the king would need to go back because you can make two queens. I'm going to make a draw. Perpetual. You don't want that. So you're going to go back. But now the difference is I have access to this square and you cannot escape checks. Rajabov went for this and didn't realize there was a massive difference between the positioning of Prague's king. However, Prague still won this game with his own creativity. The whole h4 concept to give away the, the, the square... I mean, this man just beat another world champion contender. He beat Rakaryakin yesterday, he beat Timur Rajabov today. Not so bad. I mean, when Prague beats a good player, I, I gotta feature it. And that brings me to another, round, another game from round uh, number three. And um, this is Ali Reza Ferruja versus Levon Aronian. Uh, parents, if your kids are watching, uh, pause here for a moment. Uh, speak to them, okay, about... Um, about the fact that this might be a very violent game. If they want to leave, uh, by all means. Uh, and if not, then, okay, I'm just warning you, they might have nightmares. All right? This was a crazy game. 
We have d4, knight f6, and an opening that we've seen a lot in many levels of chess, but particularly in this tournament for some reason, the London. Okay, seems to be the meta. c5, e3, and a very standard queen to b6 going for the b2 pawn. And here, Ali Reza plays one of my favorite lines, knight to c3. And the point is that he's not just giving this away for free, he will go to b5 and try to go to c7, and this line is actually known to be winning for white. So for that reason, bishop to d7 is played, cutting the access. Now Ali Reza plays rook b1, which defends the pawn. We have e6, now the players just go back to regular development, castles, takes, takes, rook c8. A move a3, very useful move, stopping anything from coming to b4, and maybe in the future I will go b4 myself. Maybe, maybe not, but I'm, you know, I'm keeping my options open. We have bishop e7, rook e1, castles. Okay, what to do? Seven pawns each, relatively balanced game. Well, let's justify this move a3, because now the knight cannot come here, so we play bishop d3. Knight cannot come to b4. Okay, great, great. Fantastic. a6. Right, that move doesn't do too much. Hmm. Well, knight to the middle, always good. It's just a good move, always. In all Londons, it's just a good move. Now, it looks like you just lost the pawn. But you didn't, because this pin is paralysis for black. It's just impossible. Like, you're threatening takes, takes, and kaboom. Check, and you win the queen. And if black were to play this move, then you really want to land this fork. So you would take the bishop, and then land this fork. Chess is a very logical and simple game sometimes. You want it, you take a step, you got it. You know, it's not like going to medical school. At least in the United States. Oh, no, no, no. So rook to d8, right? Uh, knight, to, knight to e5, rook to d8, bishop g5. And Ali Reza is just slowly improving his position. And here, Levon played a move which was very exotic, which is good if you have a fashion sense to wear exotic things like Levon. But playing moves like king to f8, just, you know, it's not a bad move, it's just a bit too much, you know? It's just the idea of the move king to f8 is the fact that maybe in the future you'll be able to move these pieces easier. Like, the king is still guarding the important stuff, and it's actually safe. Um, but Ali Reza immediately jumps on him. I mean, it's like attempting a flying knee in a fight. You're gonna get taken down. Like yesterday, Usman Masvidal. Uh, when he, in the first round, not, not the second round was not a takedown. So he's threatening mate. And here, Levon defends mate, very simple. But the problem is, you also have h7. But Ali Reza doesn't take it yet. First, he moves his knight out of the way. Why? Because he wants to create an attack. To create an attack, you need pieces. The queen needs help. Okay, queen's not Allen Iverson. The queen needs help. Queen needs to get in, so he maintains a piece on the board, takes queen h7, and now king to e7. I think at the end of the day, Levon had bon Cloud on his mind. He just, you know, the king, the king just, the castling just didn't fit it. He had to come back to its, it just had to come back to its roots. So he had bon Cloud on his mind. Knight to e2. Remember Ali Reza needs pieces? Queen needs help, right? So he brings the knight back, he's ready to kick all the pieces out. Knight to f4, etc, etc. We have king to... <laughs> okay, I'm gonna upgrade what this king is on. It's not a bond cloud. This king is just on a bad acid trip. This king's just on an acid trip and just wants to go for a run outside. I'm not speaking from personal experience. Um, I rarely bring up these subjects in my YouTube videos. This is the only logical explanation I can give, okay? Um, yeah, that's why I told parents to make their kids leave the room. C3, bishop e5, and bishop c2. All the rest is like, look, bro, I don't know what the hell you're doing. I don't know why you're playing like this. I'm gonna go for your king. F6, which just very conveniently blocks... <laughs> I... I... Okay, but... <laughs> All right, so we got this and this, uh, we got this, we got this, and in the future, we also have that. But what about just knight takes f6? So now you can't play this. If you take this, you lose a bishop from the attack. Uh, I'm threatening just to shred your king open. Rook to c7. Okay, that move looks pretty scary because the queen's under attack, but what's worth more than a queen? Yes, 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 I know you are. A king! Uh-oh. Uh-oh. You can't, you have no other move, you have to take. Only legal move, and now check. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, oh. Oh, this is not good. And Ali Reza here plays the, well, the only move, actually. Um, he has two queen moves. Queen g5 and queen h6. And queen g5, uh, 
is not uh, awful in the sense that it loses on the spot, but it completely gives away advantage because f2, he has to go to h6 because he needs to threaten the bishop and more importantly, he needs to threaten checkmate in a few moves. So we have knight takes before looking to free up some space, but he just... He just takes and and Levon just his he just <laughs> this this is not this is not right this is not correct the, the, this is this is wrong okay some things in life are subjective this is objectively incorrect and in this position Levon resigned this wasn't this wasn't a king hunt you know sometimes in games king hunts happen this was not a king hunt. This was, um, this was a bad acid trip, I'm telling you. Like, I, I, I don't know what this king... Anyway, um, but that was a pretty fun game, and Ali Reza wins. And for the last one, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna cut the nonsense. We're gonna have an endgame masterclass, okay? This was a long game. It began as a queen's gambit declined. Round 10, by the way, last game of the day. Uh, Vidit versus Shakri Armami Diarov, an A6 Queen's Gambit declined, which led to a structure known as the Karlsbad structure, and then ultimately Bishop for Knight trade, uh, and this variation where Black takes a very passive and ugly looking position early to deal with White's aggression, but uh, it, it's not so bad. Uh, well, here Vidit played H4, which is quite exotic, and he wants to play Knight G5 and Knight takes E6, isolating these weaknesses in the center of the board. Um, and uh, as you'll see, he does exactly that. So Shakriar lashes out with c5, uh, takes, and for some reason not d4, which would have attacked two things, I guess because of like queen check, and then uh, the knight can like move, I don't know, I, I didn't ask him. But he plays this instead. And then, well, we get exactly what we have here in e3. After Shakriar castles, and then actually Vidit also castles, because otherwise he was just frankly going to get checkmated, we have a super weird middle game. Um, it's bishop, bishop, and knight, knight, but they're completely opposite complexes. One guy has set up literally every piece, every pawn he has to counteract the enemy bishop. One guy's got a bunch of pawns that look like they counteract the enemy bishop, but they don't counteract this bishop at all, because I just have a direct line of attack. And I also have this, and I'm constantly threatening to sacrifice, maybe here. Like, it looks like black's position doesn't make any sense at all. But yet it's not so bad. Plays king to h8, okay? Now here, Vita plays knight e2, because he's got no forward progress on that side. This is known as a reroute, looking for a better spot over here. And how do you stop that from happening? You play the very aggressive but bold move g5. Takes, takes, and now you can no longer go here. It's a position where white is better in every sense of that word. So white is uh, better, not from a material standpoint, so I guess not every sense. White is better, king safety, much better for white. Um, the active pieces are a bit better for white. I mean, white's got four active pieces. You can't really argue this is active. That rook is dumb. This knight is, a, you know, hopeful, and this bishop is artificial. And even this queen, I mean, okay, the queen is obviously active, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, pawn structure, obviously white is better, white has less pawn islands, white has much more solid structure and foundation, and space kind of goes to black, but, 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 when you are statically worse, which black is statically worse here, dynamics are everything. Like, you can counterbalance the fact that you're statically worse by being like, okay, well, what if I just create a dogfight? If I'm down, right, I should just get in up close and try to knock the guy out. I wouldn't know, I've never been in a fight, but that's kind of the meta. Now, Vidit trades queens, but... And it makes sense because the queen was black's only active piece, but now he, you know, he, he tries to activate the rook. But his whole plan here with knight d4, rook c1, like it looks good, it looks, it looks very smart. Everything he's doing looks smart. But then this really peculiar decision happens by Mamid Yarov. Why would Mamid Yarov trade the only active piece that he had? For this, for, for, for what? To give white the, old, the open file, all pawns frozen now because you're never gonna move them. This, this, this is a target. But, Mamidyarov then moves his king to the middle, which is where kings belong in the endgame, because they're not actually ever going to be attacked. Now, Vidit probably should infiltrate with the rook here. I don't know what he's going for. Like, I don't know where he's going next. He could go to g8 next, for example. But then, in doing that, he will surrender control of the open file. So again, you have to think about the open file in endgames, right? So it's actually a fascinating endgame, and this endgame is all about that static versus dynamic concept. White is better in every sense. 
but black is still around and has plenty of dynamics to counterbalance this. When you are playing bishop for knight, you have to look at interesting ways to outmaneuver the enemy. This bishop is great, but it will never break through this. And watch as Mamidyarov baits Vidit into certain movements. b3 to prevent this, softening up the structure. Rook h7, utilizing the open file, the dynamic factor. Bishop to g4, uh-oh. Okay, the only good thing about black's position he's immediately utilizing. Checks and forces the king out, checks it again. Now the king is in everybody's way. Computer still likes the position, but here Mamidyarov finds a beautiful move. A beautiful backwards reroute, knight a8, with the, in with the intention to fight for the c7 square because white wanted to double up the rooks, which is exactly what Vita does. But notice that by using the dynamic factors of the position, the open files, the target points, he's not allowing Vita easy movement. So he plays rook c7. Now Vita plays a nice move. When, you, when you're offered a trade like this, you want to put your rook on an advantageous square. He does. He but now it's a big decision. Does he take with the pawn, getting a pass pawn? Actually, a po well, I mean, not th that move would not happen because he would lose this. But a potentially just straight up pass pawn, defended pass pawn, but closing the file. Or does he do this? It's a big decision. He chose to go with the rook. But now knight c7, a knight e8. And the knight just goes for a dance to the other side of the board. And Vidit has no advantage. What happened? What did he do wrong? Maybe he took with the rook on c5. Maybe it was better to take with the pawn and close his open file. And all of a sudden, the avalanche comes. Like, nothing about this game, like, if you look at the computer valuation, nothing about this game made any sense. It was like plus one the whole end game. But it shows you the humane element of bishop versus knight and how a bishop sometimes looks nice but has no tangible threats and all of a sudden it's completely spiraling out of control. Remember a long time ago Mami Diarev made him play this move with this knight? Well now the pawn's dead. You move it up, I just go for the other one. And then he brings in the knight and what does he do next? What does, what does a player do when they have an advantageous endgame ladies and gentlemen? They simplify it. They get it down to a winning rook and pawn endgame. He goes for the right pawn. He keeps the pass e-pawn, not allowing this king to come close. And, well, he's going to go for the final pawn. And he does exactly that, and he wins it. And, you know, he's going to give a check. Remember I said simplify? Rook takes b5 is possible, but because you are cutting off the king, and this king is just going to move and the pawn will come in this position. A few moves later, the pawn made it to e2. And now we have the wrong defense. If you notice, the king is this way, right? King is on this side. This is long side defense. This is long side defense. I have a video about this, by the way. King, and rook, king rook, and pawn endgames. Short side defense is holdable in certain situations. This is long side defense. This won't work. And after a very simple move, rook f8, he resigned. Why? Why rook f8? Patrol the file. If the king gets close, just king f1. And now you cannot give me a check, and I will just promote. And I'll promote even if you go here because I will give you a check, and then I will queen. And trust me, Mamidyarov would know how to win this endgame. And if you don't know, you gotta go learn king and rook versus king. So hopefully that was an instructive game. The, the, today's episode of, of, our, of, our, of our games had a lot of, a lot of, lot of, lot of weird stuff. It was a, it was a weird day. Um, but hopefully this final kind of endgame masterclass was nice. These are the standings after 10 rounds. Uh, very tight race for that final spot. I don't actually know the tie break. Maybe Tari's not even out like this is just th this doesn't account for tie breaks but we will know after tomorrow who makes it um as always thank you for making it this far in the video if you have it's 34 minutes it's a long time to talk about chess but if i've managed to keep your attention despite having really red puffy eyes and frankly wanting to collapse for a 12-hour nap um i'm very honored and i appreciate your support in the comment section and uh i will see you in the next recap